for listening to another episode of the Coaster 101 podcast. It's been a week since Six Flags and Cedar Fair have merged, and you know what? Guess what? We're all still alive, and it's all okay. But I am Andrew Stillwell, joined this week on the uh, West Coast by Eric Woolley. Eric, welcome back to the Coaster 101 podcast. Hi, Andrew. Thanks for having me back. You know, it's it's like I said, it's been a little bit for you. It's been a little bit for the podcast, and I feel like I say that every show, but you know what? This is one of those things we're just having fun. It's a hobby, and you know, if you want us to keep going, keep listening. So we'll start with that. But obviously, right now, the big news in the amusement industry is that Penguin Trek opened. Well, it did, but um, not. That's not really the big news. It's a good. Um, is a review on coaster one one dot com. Everyone it is go read really good. Shane somehow talked his way in. He's not a pass holder, but. Uh, allegedly talked his way in. I don't know what he did. I don't know if he played the I'm a very important theme park internet writer card. I don't know if he snuck behind somebody. We'll have to get Shane on the podcast to uh, talk about that. But head to Coaster 101, check out that review. Um, but we got to talk about this merger, Eric. I mean, I know you are a, a local to uh, two parks that are now part of the same family. And obviously Six Flags and Cedar Fair, um, unless you're You've been living under a rock for a very extended period of time. Um, you know now, by now, that Six Flags and Cedar Fair have merged. It is a leadership group managed mostly by Cedar Fair leadership, but the company is named Six Flags. But the key key distinction here, it is a merger. It is not as an acquisition. Six Flags did not buy Cedar Point. Six Flags did not buy Carowinds. They're one company now. They merged together. It was a merger of equals, I think, was the stock. Yeah, I think the I think in some article it was that the Cedar Fair shareholders have fifty one percent of the ownership of the new company and six flag shareholders have forty nine percent. Uh Cedar Fair's CEO is the CEO of the new merged company. I think Six Flag CEO is the chairman of the board, something like that. But yeah, yeah. Fair, uh, a merging of leadership teams at this point, it seems. Yeah. Like. So, Eric, like, I want I want to get your initial thoughts. We've we've known this merger is going to happen for several months at this point, probably almost a year, maybe not quite. I don't remember the exact time frame. I think it was yeah, last sometime fall, last sometime. year. It was you know, now that it is has it has gone through. What are your initial thoughts on kind of this new regional theme park world we're living in? Uh, yeah. I mean, I don't. <laughs> I think a, a thing, again, any article you read recently about it makes clear that obviously this is not making any changes to the parks in the short term. Uh, it's the middle of summer. I think everyone will, the, the parks will continue to operate as they were before for now. There's no name changes planned at this point or at least scheduled. Um, yeah, I, I think this is so COVID obviously hurt the finances and valuation of all these park chains. Um, I think it was what 2022 or 2021 that that SeaWorld uh, made a bid to try and buy Cedar Point that was lower than a bid Six Flags had made back in uh, 2019. It's so, like obviously the valuation of these companies have gone down, and it's a it's a very capital intensive uh, industry to build a roller coaster. You need to take out a loan for tens of millions of dollars, uh, at least for a big roller coaster, and so. I'm guessing that neither of the companies felt they were in a great financial position to grow more. And so I assume the reasoning for this happening is it tries, puts them together on a better financial sort of footing to be able to, to keep growing and investing in their parks the way they need to. Um, and I think that's probably for the most part, a good thing for most fans. I don't think with something like this, there's worry about, lack of competition because I don't, I mean, most of the places these parks are, there's not, there's not two parks. I'm, I'm in a unique place in Northern California. Southern California is sort of similar. Although even in those cases, they're like, yeah, the parks here are an hour and a half to two hours away from each other, depending on traffic. It's not, if you live close to Great America, you're not going to Six Flags Discovery Kingdom a lot. Um, I think the competition for theme parks is other forms of entertainment, whether it's, uh, sports or movies or going out to dinner or something like that. Other things that people go to. Um, 
So I don't think it hurts any of the parks that way. I don't think there's some part that's going to say, oh, we don't have to build a new ride now because there's we're not competing with <laughs> some park next door. Carowinds isn't going to say, well, now Six Flags over Georgia's in the same chain. We don't have to build new rides. I, I don't think that's happening. Um, no. So I think on net, probably better for the industry and better to stabilize all of these parks and chains financially. Um, that's, that was sort of my first thought at it. And then I think the second thought is, will we actually ever notice any changes? Will we? Will there be something in the future where they start to have some overlapping properties, whether it's Looney Tunes characters in a Cedar Fair Park, or are they mostly going to keep operating the way that they always have? Yeah, I think... Um, I'm looking at the exact numbers and the combined uh, parks and water parks in the the Six Flags Entertainment Corporation portfolio are now 42. And obviously that includes uh, some in-park water parks, um, in-park water parks, standalone water parks. Allegedly, there's a family entertainment center, according to Wikipedia, but I don't know exactly what that would be. But there's resorts, there's marinas, all sorts of stuff. Um, but I think... The consumer here, assuming they give us this, the one thing when the merger happened that everyone was like, okay, well, Coaster fans specifically, they now have 290 plus ish, depending on what you're counting as a roller coaster or standing but not operating or under construction, somewhere between 290 and 300 coasters. And as theme park fans, you know, we're all buying the season passes. I've got my Cedar Fair all park pass just because Carowinds is in my backyard and I try to make two to three other Cedar Fair trips a year. And it just works out financially for me for that reason. Six Flags, we're talking that you've got, you may or may not have a Six Flags pass. (laughs) Yeah, either it lapsed or I had one last year, but it was something similar of getting whichever one Six Flags passes have changed so much over the last I don't know, five years or so that I can't really keep track of what is what, but whichever one similar, like I'll go discovery kingdom, maybe a couple times a year and then magic mountain once or twice a year. And so trying to get that or though similar with the Cedar fair pass, I would usually get one that was all parks because great America close enough to me and Knott's Berry farm close enough that I would usually go once a year yeah. um, at least. Uh, so there was a really interesting article, um, Robert Niles over at Theme Park Insider, and this was amplified by um, Lance over at Screamscape, which is how I saw it. Not that I'm not reading Theme Park Insider, but I, I needed the boost from Screamscape to see it. And the headline of this article is, The New Six Flags Should Not Give Fans What They Ask For, which to me is an absolutely wild headline. Because, <laughs> like... In, in the business of of travel, tourism, and amusement parks and all these things, I think fan service is a huge reason like for brand loyalty that keeps fans coming back. And to suggest that fan like this this new company should not give fans what they ask for, it's a wild yeah, statement. And he's, 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 he's talking about one specific thing that fans are asking for. He <laughs> is. You've fallen into the clickbait trap of, sounds like you haven't read the article. <laughs> I have. I was getting ready to get into it, though. <laughs> you interrupted me. I did fall a little bit for the clickbait. But it was, he wants Six Flags to eliminate the all-park pass, the all-park season pass. Which, I think that's, again, not exactly what he says, but... that's. We'll get into. I mean, so he says in the article basically what fans, at least roller coaster enthusiasts, most hope they or want clamoring for after this is a pass that will get them into every Six Flags this year. Point now that that is a benefit of these. Um, I think his main point is that that a lot of fans are asking for that at a similar price point to what they currently pay for annual passes, and that that is not a good idea for the business. <laughs> Okay, that's that's fair. Okay, and, but he also compares it to a Disney Magic Key, and I feel like comparing the regional park season pass, even if it gets you access to forty two parks, water parks, and the one random family entertainment center, which I still somebody will tweet us and say, "Hey, here's that family entertainment center." Um, 
I don't think you're able to compare the Disney Magic Key and Disney pricing for their park tickets in general. I, I think it's a totally different ball game. But I'll ask you. I mean, I paid like just shy of two hundred dollars for my Cedar yep. Fair. What what do they call it? It was a Carowinds season pass with oh, an all God. parks add on. I forgot that they changed it again because yes, I also did that, and it was like. What? It's not a Platinum Pass anymore. Now it's a pass with an add-on for all parties. But the thing that kills me is Definitely. they're like, do you just want to keep the same ticket, same same pass? So I still have my Platinum Platinum Pass card. From like I lost my Platinum Pass card at some point, but luckily it's in the app, and I assume I never have to find the card again. <laughs> yeah. So I want to, I mean, we paid, let's say, 200 bucks ish yeah. If there was a pass... And you paid, I mean, what do you pay or what did you pay for your Six Flags membership? I mean, I was, did you get it during COVID when it was like for $4 a month, you could go to every Six Flags around the yeah. world for like. So I don't, I mean, this is this also, so he, Robert Niles talks about this a little bit in the article, right? He sort of brings up the point that from a financial point of view, like if you underprice annual passes to the point that you are getting, most of your guests are annual pass holders. And they're not spending enough money, uh, then you end up sort of having to raise the prices of ancillary things because that's what annual pass holders. You know, every time you come, you then buy some food and pay for parking, unless you're at the very top end of annual pass holders. Um, and so you have to like keep raising those if you want to raise more revenue, or you have to cut spending. Which I think it's his point of like, I think any Six Flags regular remembers seeing that. A decade ago because i feel like a decade ago the six flags annual pass at least the discovery kingdom was like 60 dollars. it was insane the season pass was so much that even years that i didn't go and with friends who would maybe go once maybe they wouldn't go at all they'd be like yeah sure whatever i'll renew my season pass uh and i think we saw that in terms of how sort of six flags parks <laughs> got less nice and operations got worse and um added fewer big rides and things like that um, yeah. And so I think, and then it was, God, I don't remember how many years ago it was, but when Six Flags got a new CEO who talked about kind of feeling like the parks were underpriced, uh, offended people by saying uh, the adults would treat as a daycare for their teenagers for they'd leave them there say, all day. Expensive babysitting, I think, is what the... Yeah, uh, which the actually time. way cheaper than a babysitter if it's a $60 season pass um, or even $100 season pass. Uh, and then, and, and talking about wanting to have sort of a, less of a Walmart, uh, clientele, more of a target clientele, uh, pissed off a lot of people with that. But I think his point still being that Six Flags, I think had really underpriced their passes for a long time. Yeah. Um, I think Cedar Fair was much more in line. I think the like $200, like made sense. That was at a level of like, oh, I'm only going to go to another park once. And so that's worth it. But if I'm not, then I won't do it. Um. And was then obviously beneficial for roller coaster geeks like us who might go to four or five different Cedar Fair parks a year. Um, I think now, so, and that was about $200. And that, I feel like it's been about $200 for a while. You could say that maybe it should be more expensive now if you look at what other <laughs> forms of entertainment cost. Um, although, as we all know, the parks sort of got hit big attendance wise during COVID. So, trying to keep prices down to get people back in the parks. Um, but I think to, so having said all that, I think there is a, an argument that like, okay, look, if you're suddenly adding, you're doubling the number of theme parks, not counting water parks, they don't care about water parks, but I think it's 26 or 27 total theme parks now under yeah. the group. And it was basically, I think there were maybe 11 under Cedar Fair, 15 or 16, Six Flags. Something so like that. Doubling, doubling that number, um, I think does make it seem like, okay, from a value point of view, like, yes, it makes sense that if you wanted to go to all of those, your pass would need to be more expensive. And I can see certainly for some regions where like, especially it makes sense. So suddenly, oh, I, I, we would occasionally do a trip where we'll go to three parks at a time and one would be a Six Flags and two Sea Fair or something. And now it's okay. These are all under one pass. The company is losing money if we can use our same Cedar Fair Pass and now not buy a ticket for the third park. Um, and so I think it makes sense that there's if there's really something that includes every park, I could I would expect that to be more expensive than a two hundred dollar pass. 
Yeah. I think the other option that we could see the parks doing is something like a regional pass. I think even Six Flags Discovery Kingdom, I think at one of their pass levels offered, you could get Discovery Kingdom and Magic Mountain together, but no other Six Flags. Um, so I could certainly see something like, look, some level of pass that is Knott's Berry Farm and Magic Mountain together um, for people in Southern California. But I think to the, the broader point of, of Niles' article about like, my hope from all from this merger is that the parks will be able to get better operations and better food service and better rides, and they need to raise revenue to do that. And I mean, I realize this is saying this as like an employed adult that I would rather it cost more and the parks be better than uh, keeping tickets kind of as cheap as possible. Um, I will say that there is something I think you're right. The comparison to Disney is not really fair because obviously Disneyland costs $200 a day. So a thousand dollar pass for Disneyland is not really the equivalent of a thousand dollar pass for uh, Six Flags or um, or Cedar Fair Park. But I could see something like a four hundred or five hundred dollar instead of two hundred dollars, and being like, "All right, that seems kind of reasonable." Especially if it includes all the other perks that we see at the 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 top end of like, okay, the free parking and stuff like yeah. that. So I mean, that was you kind of jumped into my next question. You know, what is what is the amount? If say this mythical all parks pass existed and gets you admission. Let's just say admission and parking and then like a 10% discount on food and retail, which and admission to all the ancillary events, the holiday events. What what would you feel like is that the top of the line? And I mean, I know, again, you are an employed adult um, making income. No, no kids. No kids. You're a, a, a sink, a, a single income, no kids. Uh. Sorry. So the question is, what? What? Yeah. What was? What would you pay? I, Sorry. I mean, like, so I would actually guess that there are lots of people listening to us who probably have both Cedar Fair and Six Flags passes. I'm gonna yeah. guess that those, if they have, I mean, I've never gotten the top end Six Flags pass because I don't like Six Flags parks enough to do that. But like, I think the top end Six Flags passes are similar or more expensive than the the two hundred dollars Cedar Fair that we have. So I would guess that there are lots of people already paying four hundred to five hundred dollars for the combination of both of those i don't that feels expensive to me just saying it when again i'm mean, actually comparing it to something like oh disneyland magic key that's a thousand we know disneyland is a much more expensive park to go to but i think i wouldn't be like if it was between 300 and 400 dollars like i don't think i would i wouldn't find it unreasonable to say like yeah this all park for all 27 parks in this chain Plus for parking and stuff like that, uh, three hundred and fifty or something would seem pretty reasonable to me. Especially if there were offerings that were like, "Hey, a California only pass or something gets right. you into the four parks in California," or a, like something for Virginia and North Carolina or something like that. Yeah, like I was, I was looking at a map, and you could kind of, you could definitely divide it into regions. You know, the California parks plus the the water park in Arizona, they could be a pass. Oklahoma has frontier city and then you've got texas right there about that yeah (laughs) so you could do oklahoma and texas could be a region you could kind of do illinois and then missouri and valley fair up in minnesota maybe throw michigan's adventure in there as well in that region you could kind of do a mid-atlantic region which would get you i don't know six flags six flags america uh king's dominion carowinds and six flags over georgia uh, you could do an Ohio region, which really is just Cedar Point and Kings Island, which isn't too <laughs> different. And then you could do like a Northeast region, which would get you, um, I mean, you can maybe throw Great Escape and Canada's Wonderland into that that kind of pod. And then you could do um, Dorney Great Adventure, um, Six Flags, New England, uh, the other upstate no, Great Escape, and I'm thinking of Darien Lake for the Toronto one. I misspoke there, but Great Escape and then La Ronde. So, I mean, I think if you wanted to do something kind of regional like that, I think you could. Yeah, um, I think you could also do something like, I mean, I guess it depends a little bit of how Sear 
fair slash six flags view their parks because i think there's also if you look at the full list of parks i think there's a clear break between parks that are very much just regional parks like eh, nobody's flying to san francisco to go to six flags discovery kingdom probably but most people i think the number of people who will like would say cedar point or uh maybe Six Flags Great Adventure or Six Flags Magic Mountain, Knott's Berry Farm are sort of destination parks that you would be like, look, I'm going to take a trip to Cedar Point for a couple days, even without being the, the crazy level of coaster enthusiast. Like somebody who just likes theme parks, I could see doing that. So maybe what? there's some sort of pass that like can add the, you can add a destination park where it includes just the kind of big parks and doesn't include the smaller parks or something, or like includes your home park and some number of, of the big parks that they want you to come where then you're coming and you're staying in a hotel and they know you're doing that. What if there was the option and I'm just spitballing here, this could be a free idea if they're still trying to figure this out. What if you, the only option is a, is a, for example, a Carowind season pass say you pay a hundred dollars or whatever their price is for their gold pass. I know they've got the silver pass right now that like pays for itself in two visits includes parking and admission through the end of the summer. Like, so no scare wins, no winter fest. So you have a base level pass like that. But then if you were to go to King's dominion or whatever, your parking is ten dollars, and your tickets ten dollars, and you, it's like twenty bucks every yeah. time you visited outside of or like, of that realm. I mean, like a, 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 dis, a discount on tickets to other parks. I mean, that would be yeah. a good way of doing it, where you still get some incremental revenue, and it might be worth it for people. Right, just an idea. I don't know. I, I am curious though. You and I, we're I feel like we're pretty similar in our our thoughts on the both legacy chains and which one do we like more. Um, and maybe I'm wrong here. I don't know. But I want to I want to propose a question to you. What is one thing that you would like to carry over from previous Six Flags to the Cedar Fair, former Cedar Fair Parks? And then one thing from the previous Cedar Fair Parks you'd love to carry over to the new or the current Six Flags or whatever we're calling Legacy Six Flags Parks? Oh, that's a hard question because I'm... <laughs> Okay, it's hard for me to think of a specific thing that I love about either chain. So, I, so it's something I think again. This question would have been answered differently, I think, if it had been ten years ago. Because um, I feel like in the last maybe five years ish, maybe it's more post pandemic. Six Flags has started to be more Cedar Fair like. I think they've added, you know, they've added. Uh, there's like food festivals at Six Flags parks, which was never that was a Cedar Fair thing 10 years ago. Um, I know that when uh, uh, they've started investing more in like park beautification and theming and stuff like that. I mean, I went to, I guess it was even when um, Sidewinder Safari, the, the wild mouse at Six Flags Discovery Kingdom opened in 2022, talking to the sort of the project head at the park at the time. He was saying this was the first time he'd gotten like a budget to kind of do other things around the ride instead of just install the ride. Um, and so I think I would have said, look, the Sierra Fair parks are nicer looking, like they just have a better, and that's something that I would want to carry over to Six Flags Parks. And I think Six Flags Parks have all, had already started doing, so it's something that I expect will carry over, that I think they will, some of the food and the, um, and the, uh, yeah, park, theming, I guess, will carry over. Although, again, I say that with also the point that in the way, and maybe this is something I hope they would carry over, but I think actually both chains secretly did, just most of us didn't realize it, um, is kind of Cedar Fair having a little bit of more character, I think, in their parks. Um, carrying that over to Six Flags a little more, although I would also say that having, I think it was 2022, I went to Six Flags Fiesta, Texas for the first time, and that park has lots of character. There's tons of really well-themed rides and well-themed areas, and it looks nice, and it's got the cool, like, cliff behind Superman and stuff. Um, and Six Flags Over Texas is similar. And so it's like, oh, there clearly are parks in the Six Flags chain that they did actually keep some of that character. It's just there are lots of parks in the Six Flags chain that don't have them. 
Um, so that would have also been something that I would say, oh, I hope they preserve that. In terms of stuff from the Six Flags parks to <laughs> the Sea of Fire parks, I don't know if there's something specific. I feel like Six Flags parks, maybe on average, this really isn't true. In my head, on, on average, Six Flags parks have the bigger, better roller coasters, or at least more. But I don't know if that's actually true now that I actually think about what what parks are in each each chain. And maybe it's more of the um, the like I went Six Flags back in the day kind of add, would add attractions to every park. And maybe Six Flags has a little bit less of the completely forgotten parks than the Cedar Fair chain does. And so maybe some of that. Although I do think there's sort of an argument that that kind of spraying out your investment across too many parks is actually something that I would say one of my biggest worries with the merger of like oh, they've got more capital and financing and can invest more in parks, but they also now have 27 parks to spread that across or whatever. And I feel like, well, if you were in the bottom third of Cedar Fair parks, it's like, well, okay, there's only seven other parks or something. Now, if you're in the bottom third of Six Flags parks, it's like, well, there's 20 parks ahead of you <laughs> to, yeah. to get to get attention. Um, True. But I think yeah. Six Flags, you know, you could argue they did a good job of spreading out some of that investment, maybe more so than than Cedar Fair did. Yeah. And I think Six Flags fans will tell me that's wrong. Yeah. I think personally, I think Six Flags, especially with their roller coasters and and thrill rides in recent years, I think they've, they've, they're not afraid to, to try something. You know, we've got the example like um, flash vertical velocity. I think that's what it's called up at Six Flags great adventure opening, presumably later this year, the, uh, the coma super boomerang, um, you know, they were the first park to work with RMC. Um, I believe they were, it was, well, they were the first park. Them and Great America both got the RMC single rails the first year. Uh, California's Great America, not Six Flags Great America. Although, since then, the the big single rails, the like other ones have only been Great Adventure and Magic Mountain, right? Yeah. So I think I think Six Flags is willing to experiment a little bit. Um, you know, some of the, sometimes that works out and you get these really cool attractions. Other times, you know, they, they take a swing and um, I've yet to hear anybody say that the kid flash cosmic coasters, it looks really cool and all that. I've heard they're more, more down than they are up. I feel like, which it is, you know, I hate that because I'm going to six flags over George later this year. I need two coaster credits. I need them to be up. So we'll uh, we'll see what happens there. So I think I hope Six Flags, you know, their their willingness to kind of swing for the fences and take a take a gamble on a a new attraction. And I I mean it's not to say Cedar Fair doesn't obviously because you know they're they just they took a huge swing and right now uh, we're still waiting for the uh, the pitch um, up in Sandusky because who knows what's going to happen with top thrill too, but they're taking, they took a big swing and I don't fault them for taking a big swing. I don't fault Zamperla. I don't fault the park. I'd like to know when it's going to reopen, but that is what it is. Um, in due time, you know, I know everybody's working on it. They want it to be safe and safety is important. Um, but I, I do want to say from the Cedar fair side, there are, and you kind of hit on it here. Uh, the two things that I would love to see kind of come over from Cedar fair to legacy six flags parks, are the concept of an executive chef um, because yeah. I know most of the legacy Cedar fair parks have executive chefs and like full blown culinary teams. And it's not just Johnny rockets and chop six and a sports bar that has, you know, a $20 chicken sandwich in it. Like they, there's some thought behind the menus and yeah. sign of kind of some regional tastes. I know specifically Carowinds, they lean heavily into the barbecue and the Southern food. Um, I'm, I'm sure they do the same up at, you know, King's Dominion as well. I mean, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of like regional influences they could bring in with these parks. And I saw uh, this week that King's Island was bringing back their chef's plate, which is basically like a, a gourmet meal inside a theme park, which is to me is wild. I love that so much. Cause I'm a, I'm a fat kid slash foodie at heart. And, um, but so if I could see some of the Cedar fair food service and food variety and food taste, yeah. um, come to six flags. And yeah, I think that 
the idea and concept of building out a ride with a full blown story. Um, a lot of times at Six Flags, it's a ride, and this is previous experience. I'm sure they've gotten a little bit better. Um, maybe, maybe not. I don't know. Um, but a lot of times it's a ride. It's red. You call it Superman. You build it in a parking yeah. lot, and your queue is cardboard cutouts of uh, cartoon characters yeah. from comic books that people may or may not recognize. And they're like tertiary and quaternary characters from the Superman universe. It's like Dr. Supergirl. And it's like, who is that? I mean, I've never heard of this person before. Yeah. And especially in the era now where all of these comic book movies are their real life and we've brought them in multiple different variations to our film screens. And, but Six Flags is still all in on the cartoon character, which is, I'm sure, what they have the license for. Yeah. The, the comic book version. <laughs> but, you know, if people are going to ride a coaster theme to Harley Quinn, they want the Margot Robbie version. They don't want the comic book version, I feel like, in 2024. But that's that's just my thought. But I think being able to build these stories out, and there are there are some examples where Six Flags has done this really well. Uh, some yeah. of their Batman-themed coasters, I know... Uh, the Dark Knight, which is the yeah. that's Although, the, in, the the indoor the wild indoor mouse. Ones. But a lot, of, so I will say, like a lot of those were built in the like nineties and two thousands, right? Yeah, I think. But, so I mentioned earlier Six Flags We Asked to Texas, and I think one of the rides that I was I knew almost nothing about it before going was Doctor Diabolical's Cliffhanger, which, I, as far as I know, is an original IP and is, is. the best themed dive coaster. I haven't been on Iron Menace, maybe it's well themed, but I was shocked at like oh they've got like a cue with effects and they've got like a voiceover track and what is all of this what is going on at the six flags and was sort of like how what i don't i didn't know six flags did this yeah i think like you mentioned earlier i think there are the parks that are are kind of the the haves if you will of of the chain you know fiesta texas is one magic mountain is one great adventure is one and on the the cedar fair side you know, Kings Island, Cedar Point, Knott's Berry Farm is another one I feel like that comes to mind. Maybe not as much in recent years, but there, you've got the the higher tier parks. But on the flip side, you've got parks like Six Flags America, Six Flags St. Louis, Loran, Michigan's Adventure, Valley Fair, um, and Worlds of Fun to a lesser extent. I, mean, I think I Dor- Dorney guys. before this year we would have put on that. Yeah, same thing with with um, Worlds of Fun. There was Zambezi Singer the year before. There, there's definitely a a a tier system where you've got your, your A team and your B team. So I'm hoping we can, we can, you know, one band, one sound, this thing, and, uh, you know, make all the parks a little bit better. Um, maybe not at the, at the sacrifice of some of your top tier parks. You don't need to dumb them down. You just need to work on making those parks that are the, again, we'll call them the B team, um, better and so they're a team and maybe not as forgotten i think that's definitely what we need to do um or what they need to do i should say yeah i mean certainly that i think it's what we would hope would happen although i i don't (laughs) from an overall company financial view it's it's a question of how much is that investment worth versus getting more people to to make a destination of of the big parks Right. Uh, I think on the plus side, at least, there aren't too many overlaps like we mentioned before. So it doesn't seem like they would. There aren't ones that I think like would get closed or something unless that was going to happen, no matter who owned them. I think you're less likely to have a park closed now than we would have been had the two chains stay separate. Do you think? Uh, what do you think they're gonna? Do you think um, we'll go to your local park? Do you think they're gonna do anything with California's Great America or any? Or do you? I think mean, they've, gonna... they've already sold the property, so they aren't getting that back. Uh, I don't. It's. I haven't followed it closely recently. At the time, it was you know they had a a certain length of contract that they were required to keep operating the park, and then there was like optional to keep extending it. Um, and if that hasn't changed, then I, maybe there's a slightly bigger chance that they keep extending it. But again, I feel like it. I feel like it's not really going to change anything because I think it's safe to say that any deal, either something like that or plans to build a new coaster that were already in the works, probably aren't changing at this point. I don't think it's. I think generally in the theme park world, the 
ship is usually too big to change direction once it's once it's going no matter what other changes there are. i think most of like things we would see from this merger like that we actually would experience i imagine would be changes that we'll see a few years down the road yeah well i want to bring up another article kind of to wrap this up um and it's from CNN. Uh, the author is Nathaniel Meyerson. I'm assuming that's how you pronounce it. Meyerson, Meyerson, something like that. And I may be falling victim to the clickbait factory here. <laughs> the headline on this article from Saturday, July 6th, these two amusement park giants just merged. Roller coaster fans are nervous. And not only did I have my mom send me this article, I had one of my former coworkers send me this article literally within like 14 seconds of each other. Did, via did they ask you if you're nervous? Um, my mom did. She did because that's <laughs> what she does sometimes. Um, you know, well, was, that, was that not related to the article? It was just in general yeah, just checking general, up on you. <laughs> pretty much. But, you know, I, I read this article and first of all, they, they quoted – you know, a Six Flags season pass holder. They quoted a another podcast, um, an amusement park content creator, which, first of all, nothing against that person. I'm sure Coaster Conquest and the Theme Park Stand podcast are great. Don't start insulting, insulting not, people. Why didn't Andrew? they come to us? Why didn't they come to us? That's all well, I want to know. Maybe they like, did, and John ignored the inbox. I don't know. We don't well, know. he's usually pretty good about that. That's how I've been on NBC News. I got to almost talk to Lester Holt. Like, that was... <laughs> but let's... I'll, I'll, I'll propose the... Yeah, the question. Are you nervous, Eric? Uh, no. I mean, I think, like I said, I don't think any changes we see will be in the, in the short term. I, and I think, in general, is isn't going to affect these parks too much. Um, I don't know that it makes me any more optimistic that we'll get things like better operations that I think we, we all wish these parks would have, unless they start charging more for season passes. Um, it's funny. I think one of, one of the guys quoted in this did say that they we're worried about the cost of an all park season pass will be really expensive, which we talked about a lot. Um, although he says because of less competition and I don't think that's, as I said, I don't think parks view competition as other theme parks. I think they view it as other forms of entertainment. Um, and one person and mentions the worry that the Cedar fair parks will lose their sort of distinct identities, which I don't, I'm not, I don't think I'm worried about that because I think that, would especially with Cedar Fair's management sort of taken over. Like I think they realize that for a park like Knott's Berry Farm or Canada's Wonderland, or on the other side, something like Fiesta Texas, like that that is that is a big part of the draw. And it would be and that would be more expensive to take away that character <laughs> than to maintain it. Yeah. Um I I mean I, I definitely agree with you. I think I'm not worried about the 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 losing of the character basically because again even your your parks that are what i will call your smaller parks i mean something like michigan's adventure people love that park for its charm it may not get a new roller coaster ever but it's got that big beautiful lake in it you know worlds of fun was originally themed to jules verne's around the world in 80 days and you have these different theme park lands and I mean, I could keep going. Carowinds is deeply rooted in the the heritage of the Carolinas, and Canada's Wonderland goes all in on um, multicultural experiences and embracing its Canadian heritage. Fiesta Texas has the cliff and all of this theming, and it's awesome. Um, you know, the other Six Flags parks, maybe not as much, but I don't think you're going to have to worry about, you know, it's never going to be Six Flags over the Carolinas or... Um, Six Flags Richmond, like it's those aren't those things aren't coming. Yeah. Like yeah. Six Flags Berry Farm is um, it's not on the horizon. I think that they'd have to re seem likely. They'd have to rename a whole chicken restaurant if you're going to whitewash <laughs> the uh, the knots the knots name off that park. Like you can't do that. So I'm not worried, and I think when you've got some some of the better brains in the especially in the regional park space. Um, Six Flags has, they've got brand recognition and have since the, you know, since the sixties and seventies, just like a lot of these Sea or fair parks are coming up or just had their 50th anniversary. You've got a lot of smart people at the helm of these places. And I really think 
And at the end of the day, like you mentioned, the competition, there's competition out there. There's competition from the United Parks and Resorts. There's competition from Disney and Universal and Hershey and all of these U.S. operators. There's competition from the independent parks like a Hershey or a Holiday World. Like, there's always going to be competition, but the competition, I think Adam Sandy said it in the article we wrote about the family coaster revolution. The competition is a movie theater. It is yeah. sporting events. It is kids' sports practices. I mean, these are all things that are competition in the world we live in right now. So I think you've got a lot of really good, intelligent people running the ship. And it is it is a it's a little bit of a sticker shock, culture shock type thing when you're like, oh, Six Flags owns Cedar Fair now or Cedar Point now. It's like, yeah. I never thought I'd see the day. Well, nobody ever thought they'd see the day. I mean, that was... I feel like one of our earliest podcast episodes was titled Cedar Fair, S-E-A-D-A. Uh, yeah, when yeah. when uh, SeaWorld was offered yeah. by them. So nobody ever thought we'd see the day, but, you know, it's the world we live in. And I, at the end of the day, the way I see it, there is a chain out there right now that has 290 plus coasters. And, like... That is far more than literally any other chain in the world right now. I think the next next competitor is the uh, Fanta Wild chain in China has 123. And those are the only two park chains that have over 100 coasters to their name. So more coasters will come, more rides will come. Hopefully they take the the best of both worlds. And whatever Hannah Montana yeah. said, get the best of both worlds, chill it out, take it slow, then you rock out the show. I think that's what it says, right? And now now we've got Disney involved. So we're great. So that, I'm not worried. I don't think nobody needs to be worried because at the end of the day, it's an amusement park. You either go or you don't go. But, you know, we're going to continue to go because we have a podcast and a website that we need to maintain. That's, worst, that's case, my worst case, we can spend all the money on our, that we would have spent on our new all park pass on two days at Disney World. You know, you're it's not wrong. So expensive. Anyway, on that on that subject, uh, go check out Coaster101.com. Eric actually wrote an article earlier this year if it was cheaper to go to Tokyo Disneyland than Walt Disney World, right? Yeah. On the West Coast? Yes, for me. So, oh, which I think, honestly, even can kind of apply to people who are not on the West Coast or yeah. if you were thinking about Disneyland. So. And even better yeah. because the Japanese yen has continued to get weaker. It is almost free to visit Japan now. Financial advice with Eric Woolley. Fly to Japan. It's free. But yeah, head to Coaster101.com if you like the written word. We've talked about the merger. We've talked about new rides opening. And we're getting ready to get into announcement season. Uh, I know some parks, Kings Dominion specifically, uh, they've been teasing on their Instagram. Um a lot of parks have projects in the works. Um, so go check that out. We talk about all that, but also follow us on social media. We're at Coaster 101, anywhere you can consume the platform. Um, so Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, slash X. We, we're on TikTok and we're, we're actually making TikToks. If you go to our TikTok channel, you can see me do blind rankings of uh, roller coasters and U.S. amusement parks. So if you really am cu are curious as to what I look like, it's confusing, but um, I'm on the TikTok page. So Coaster 101 there as well. Uh, if you're listening, make sure you're liking, rating, reviewing, subscribing, and doing all of those fun things, building the show audience and keep us wanting to do this podcast because we enjoy doing it. It just helps when other people are listening as well. And last but not least, uh, you got to get the merch. Uh, we don't have a video podcast as of yet, but I'm currently sporting our new um, Coaster 101 podcast hat. Are, are you wearing that in, in your TikToks, Andrew? Uh, and the first one I did, actually. Yeah. There I you was, go. Uh, you know, got to get the merch. Uh, so that's c101.co slash tpublic, T-E-E-P-U-B-L-I-C. Uh, hats, t-shirts, magnets, stickers, tote bags, pillows, wall art. I mean, there's a lot of random stuff on there but if you want to support coaster 101 and wear your love for our show or our website on your uh, sleeve or head we got you so go check out the t public thanks as always to justin mabry of jmmd entertainment for our theme music and you want to talk about somebody who's working with six flags and cedar fair already 
Those guys have shows all over the place. So the merger is great for them as well. But all right, Eric, this was fun. We will uh, we'll talk to you all again soon, and uh, see you later. Bye.